Hello everyone, welcome to my last video of the year. If everything goes according to plan, this video should come out December 31st at 11.59pm, so one minute before 2024. With that, I wanted to make sure that I talked about all of my favorite two types of media, movies and music, in one video, and that's what this is. I'm going to talk about best albums first because it's going to be easier than the movies. Let's start with some honorable mentions. These were albums I saw on a lot of different lists, and I didn't want to include them on mine, not because they're not good, but just because everybody else is going to talk about them. So with that being said, the first album is Caroline Polachek's Desire I Want to Turn Into You. I actually really liked this album earlier in the year when it came out, and I haven't really come back to it as much, but it is good. It's really solid. This album is a really bizarre are strange pop album that I think a lot of people have been paying attention to more recently, so I'm glad it's getting the attention it deserves. Speaking of weird, 10,000 Gex came out this year, and I kind of forgot about it until I made this list, but this is an album, that's for sure. Next is The Record by Boy Genius. Of course I was gonna like this album, but I'm not gonna be like the biggest supporter of this sort of thing, you know? Just because you get three of the most beautiful people in modern indie music and put them together, doesn't mean they get an automatic spot on this list, though it's like 90% of the reason. 20 bucks is the best song on here. I know it's like overplayed, but still. It's... Next is Olivia Rodrigo's Guts. Now, I actually didn't like Olivia Rodrigo's first album. I thought Sour was kind of like, for lack of a better word, it was kind of shit. And it's weird because Olivia's not doing anything that different on this album. I think it's just she's putting herself like she's being more unhinged i think is what i really enjoyed out of this record uh the guitar solos throughout are pretty good the only songs i didn't like were like vampire and uh that idea was like it's weird because it kind of grew on me like i at first when i heard the song i went like ew i don't like this song and now i'm like wait but this is kind of catchy okay next is uh SOS. This came out really early in the year, and that's why it's kind of ending up on the spot, because I, after it came out, like, didn't really listen to it um, as much. And also, SZA isn't really, like, the, the artist for me. Like, don't get me wrong, I like, like, listening to SZA. Same thing with the next record, uh, Mitski's The Land is Inhospitable and So Are We. I wish this album was as good as its title sounds, but still, some very powerful, consistent songwriting, like, the one thing you can say about Mitski is that she hasn't really made a bad album in like the past 10 years. Okay, let's get into the list proper because I've spent too much time already on the honorable mentions. Number 10, Sufjan Stevens' Javelin. Now I didn't put this album any higher because it's fucking depressing. I've listened to this album like once fully through and then like twice kind of halfway through because uh, I'm usually pretty torn up halfway through. There's obviously a lot that's happened with Sufjan since the release of this album, before the album came out, after the album came out. I just hope the best for him, and I hope he has a good recovery. Next is Kara Jackson's Why Does the Earth Give Us People to Love? This is a more recent addition because I only found out about Kara Jackson like two months ago, and that's mostly because they were on the new Kevin Abstract album, and I thought, ooh, that's, that's a cool name, let me look up. And turns out their album came out this year too, so. Car Jackson's a poet and won Poet Laureate 2020. And it really does show in these songs, like the songwriting on display here, the lyrics that just come out of the mouth are fucking devastating. It's also just incredibly relatable. Kara, I don't think is too much older than me. I'm gonna have to look that up too. But it sounds like a young person talking, you know? Anyway, check this album out if you like folky sort of singer-songwriter stuff. I know these first two albums have been like a little low-key, but that all changes with the next one. Korean Shoegaze, Paranol. After the Magic came out in the early, early morning of this year, and it was fucking amazing. Paranol's last album was like one of my favorites of that year, so it, it makes no fucking sense how they are so consistently good in this genre. I can't wait for them to tour somewhere in America. Next we have Slauson Malone's Excelsior. This was an album that kind of flew under my radar, but after listening to Slauson's other releases, I've been very intrigued to see what they've been doing recently. And this album came out this year, and it kind of is similar to their other albums. Still very abstract, songs are not very long, but when they are, they're usually these blends of strings and pianos or avant-garde melodies, or minimalism is used to a great extent, but also like subtle vocal harmonies. This album is like 
one that you don't really like bump in the car because there's no real like bangers on this album there's just like experimental there's just like experiments sonic experiments throughout the entire album and so it made it actually more enjoyable for me to re-listen to it because it felt like a new album every time next is joanna sternberg's i've got me this one is like also similar to the first two singer songwriter but like just blisteringly honest the most blisteringly honest thing I've ever heard. I won't say too much. At number five, we have Jane Remover's Census Designated. This was one I was so looking forward to. I have their first release, Frailty, on CD, so when this album was released, I was expecting more of the same, but I got, like, the same and then half of it got chopped off, put into a fucking SCP-511 or 409, maybe? Shit, what is the SCP that, like, you put it, okay, this is a dumbass reference that I only own. Half of it was put in there and it was put on course and it came out and now it's like the weirdest thing ever. It's like a grunge, grunge gazy album full of these weird glitches and, and like this sort of sound is like maybe not new to Jane Remover, but like before this album, like Jane Remover barely played any guitar in their songs because I think self-admittedly in an interview I remember reading, like they don't know how to play guitar very well. Maybe now they do. All right, next album, Wall Socket by Underscore. Now this actually features Jane Remover on one of the longer songs. I think it's like I was looking down at my fucking infinitely long hands because liminal space image. But besides that song, this album is so fucking good. Like. It was the same reaction I got when I first listened to the first Jane Remover album. It was like, this is unique and different. Wow, this is catchy and unique and different. It's the best kind of feeling in music, and that's why I'm putting it so high, because I know that a lot of people have been putting this album pretty high up in their list, but like, really, trans music is the best music. Like, look at the number of trans people in my list. Like, it's not even fair. Please listen to Wall Socket. Also, like, just great album covers for both of the Jane Remover and the Underscores album. What's up with that? Okay, next album, Dogs Barking. Number two, Reverend Kristen Michael Hader, Saved. Formerly known as Lingua Ignota, Reverend Kristen Michael Hader is the new pseudonym for the Lingua Ignota project, but not necessarily in sound. Yes, it does have the same person doing the instrumentals and the vocals, but it's arranged in a way that seems completely different than the last album. There are still pianos and choral performances, hymns, religious themes, but they're turned all the way up and also given a sheen of cassette distortion or some sort of denigration over time. Also the tape like stops and skips and this is one of the most emotional albums I've had to listen to all year, especially the last track. I still can't listen to it in full because the Glossialia wrecks me. Like it wrecks me in a weird way because like it's not screaming, it's not crying, it's just transcendent horror, one could call it. And with that brings me to my last and my favorite album of the year, Wednesday's Rat Saw God. I made a whole video on Wednesday. I cannot believe that this album is my favorite of all of their albums. I still don't own it on a physical release, but I swear this album has been taking up my ears for the better part of this year. Listen to songs like Shock, Bull Believer, the intro track. It's so good. Like, when I saw Anthony Fantano review this, he gave it like a six. Fuck him. He can suck it. That's my list. I hope you found some good albums from that list. Now we're transitioning to the, the second part of this video. Best movies. All right, best movies. We'll do honorable mentions again because these are all the movies I didn't see this year, but I saw all over other people's lists. First of all, talk to me. Passengers, Poor Things, which I really do want to see because you know how much I love Yorgos Lanthimos. Dream Scenario, Bottoms, Barbie, The Iron Claw, the Killer, Rotting in the Sun, and Maestro. Those are all the films I didn't see, but like, if I didn't mention them here, people would fucking run. All right, number 10, Infinity Pool. This is a Brandon Cronenberg film, AKA Nepotism Baby. I think it's just very interesting the way that Brandon has decided to spin his father's formula of body horror and existentialist imagery into this sort of kind of formulaic movie if you think of it in the way of these more recent movies like The Menu or Glass Onion or Saltburn, I think. I haven't seen it, but that's also one that's kind of like Eat the Richie. 
anything that kind of feels eat the rich, uh, I kind of find it a little disingenuous because you're in the, the field of Hollywood. Like, Infinity Pool was an interesting watch, and that last scene when there's the two clones of them and they're like fighting each other is like, that kind of was weird as hell. Like, low key, I haven't seen much things that have made me feel as weirded out as that scene. And it stuck with me after watching it unlike the other movies like the menu like what the fuck was that movie even about like seriously fucking stupid dumb bitch from from queen's gambit i i don't mean to call her that i'm so sorry yeah, number nine asteroid city i actually only saw this one like a week ago for the first time because it came on amazon prime and i was like might as well asteroid city is a movie about a play about making a movie about a play no Asteroid City is about a playwright making a play, and you get to see the play, and it's also a movie about a town in which these people live in called Asteroid City. And uh, that's about as good as I'm gonna get. Asteroid City is a hard one to pin down because I feel like I understand a lot of what is going on in this film, a lot of the meta-narrative, a lot of like, what, what does this mean? Another film later on the list like makes this more apparent, but Asteroid City is like a film about creation, about making art and struggling to make art. Being dissatisfied or fed up or frustrated about making your pieces of art in the way that you want them, I guess. Or having people understand specific ways of interpreting them. And that felt really relatable to me in a weird way. And I watched this movie with my parents and I got very weird reactions from them. Like, what does this mean? Why are there so many A-list actors doing these weird lines? Why is the pausing so long? You know, like typical, like, people who don't watch Wes Anderson questions and it made me realize that this movie is like surprisingly more complicated than I thought on a first watch. That's what makes it kind of cool because watching videos afterwards of people reviewing them I totally picked up on different cues or signals like I didn't really even understand what the relationship was in a lot of this circumstance. But anyway it's a Wes Anderson. I know he came out with all those short films this year not gonna talk about them. Number eight I'm probably gonna cut this is the most all right number eight is the most popular film on this list, uh, Oppenheimer. I know I said Barbie was in my uh, honorable mentions, but it's actually because I haven't seen Barbie. I have seen Oppenheimer though. Look at my interests floating. I just thought it would have been more interesting to watch Oppenheimer. And this hit me at the time when I was like, I want to watch a three hour movie. And it was the only option really at the time besides the next movie on this list, but we'll get to that in like a moment. Oppenheimer like cinematically looks beautiful. I'm kind of in disbelief how they created a lot of these shots of like the dust and the swirling and the particles, the explosion itself, and yeah, I mean, I'm not going to spoil anything. I know this movie is still like, some people still haven't seen it, but like, come on, bro. Christopher Nolan's like kind of weird to me because I really didn't feel like Inception was like the greatest movie ever. Neither did I think Dunkirk was. What was the movie he made before this? Some other shit, but it probably... Oh, Tenet. Oh my god, 2020. God, the year of Tenet. Uh, I didn't like Tenet. But Oppenheimer ended up on my list because even though it's very all over the place, after watching it twice, which means I spent six hours watching this movie, I came to the conclusion that it all was relatively necessary. The only thing that I thought was unnecessary was the amount of nudity that they forced Florence Pugh to do. They didn't force her because obviously there's like consent. But still, there's no reason why I had to see Florence Pugh's boobs as much as I did in this movie. Not complaining. Actually, I am complaining. Okay, next is Bo is Afraid. Also three hours long. Ari Aster is the director that everybody knows, and I'm not gonna keep pretending like nobody knows who Ari Aster is because it's not 2007. My personal favorite thing about this film is how ambitious it is because when you look at a hereditary, you look at Midsummer and you see movies that could be feasibly made. Yes, they have big set pieces, shit catches on fire, but it's like they're horror movies, or at least they are striving to be in this kind of genre of horror. This movie, on the other hand, is horrific. Um, but I don't call it a horror movie. I, I think it's just a stress watch. And people have beaten the point of like, yes, the movie is an allegory about anxiety and mother issues, but it's also like, a little bit of daddy issues too. That penis in the attic was no fucking fluke. Okay, I'm not gonna talk more about this film because really it's it's a hard film for me to 
talk about good performances, good movie overall, but like exhausting. The next movie is The Zone of Interest. I'm going to say three words. Come and see. Number five is Godland. I got to see this one on Criterion because it had a premiere on Criterion. And wow, what a fucking beautiful movie. I think it's set in Iceland and you're following this photographer. You know, he's taking these pictures of these people who you would assume that they probably don't have much contact with photography, but he's like instructing them as if they know uncomfortable gaze of like the way that he sees the world, the way that he wants it to be documented. And I thought it was just kind of stunning. All right, moving on to the next one. How to Blow Up a Pipeline. Now this one technically came out in 2022. There's also another movie on here that came out in 2022, but like just fucking barely. Uh, this one actually didn't get a wide release until 2023, so I count it in my 2023 list. How to Blow Up a Pipeline is based on a book. It's also about how to blow up a pipeline. All right, number three, The Boy and the Heron. Uh, I just saw this one about two weeks ago and I saw it twice, which was great because I really did not get it the first time and the second time I really did. The Boy and the Heron is the Hayao Miyazaki film that everyone's been waiting for that isn't his last film but it really should be his last film and it's really great. It's really good and I encourage everybody who is watching this video, if you can, uh, go see this movie. It is like walking into a dream or like walking into a child's dream more specifically. I'll say this, after a certain point in the film, the logical like continuity starts to like take a nosedive and that's when it really starts to get interesting. Some of his most beautiful, surrealist, affecting, moving imagery, lots of repeating motifs. I would encourage anyone to watch this in the original Japanese dub, which I didn't have the availability to, but if you can, do because the translations are different and they have a different explanation I guess for this ending of the movie which if you watch it a certain way can feel really unfulfilling but in watching it a second time it felt like the best way that they could have ended things off on like I couldn't imagine a story past the point in which it ended and that's the good thing about movies is you can really just run them by people's eyes and be like yes this is the perfect version all right, number two. This is the movie I was referencing about uh, Asteroid City, about like creativity and stuff. Showing Up is a movie all about showing up for your different artistic endeavors. And it hit me really hard because honestly, making art in this world, in this time, in any, any time ever that I've ever been living has always felt like a chore. Like I'm, you know, not even there most of the time. And this movie really felt like it knew exactly where I'm coming from, and that's why I'm putting it at my number two. Not a lot of people have seen this movie, so check it out. The other movie that's technically like a 2022 movie, but it like got a wide release like December 21st, 2020. Like most people could like not even, like a majority of people probably didn't see this movie until 2023. And it was Joyland. I know we had Godland before, but Joyland is my favorite film of the year. And it's weird because there are a lot of great movies on this list, but this one stuck with me the most. It is about many things, many different ways, and maybe isn't exactly the most comfortable movie to watch as a trans person, but even seeing the representation of trans people in this Middle Eastern culture of Pakistan that they're in was very interesting, and the characters do a lot of growing in it that even though it the movie was pretty heavily censored by the government that it was a part of, it still managed to get a wide release at Cannes and was, I think, the film that won that year? I don't know, fuck. But I really did like this movie. You should check it out. I like to put movies that people should check out or albums that people should check out at like the one and two spots. Like These are the movies that really resonated with me. Check it out if you haven't. I'll see you guys later, I guess. I mean, peace.